Smith, who's the director of Triumph, and he's going to tell us about himself and Triumph. So, thanks. <laughs> thank you, Douglas. So good afternoon, and thank you for the uh, invitation to give a colloquium. Uh, as Douglas said, that I'm relatively new to Triumph. I've only been in post just over five months, so uh, really getting up to speed on the research program there, getting to know the West Coast, getting to uh, yeah. see, how, uh, see how life on this side of the country is. So the, uh, what I'd like to do today, because I you know, don't know the community that well in terms of nuclear and particle physics, in terms of the nuclear physics side of things, is introduce myself to you, uh, introduce Triumph and the accelerators that we have, give a very brief overview of the Triumph research. You'll see that it's a, an incredibly broad span of research, so it's uh, impossible to do it all justice, and talk about some of the future planning at Triumph. So a little bit about me. Um, I was born in Britain, grew up in Nottingham. Uh, Nottingham is famous for Robin Hood, so it's near Sherwood Forest. Uh, it's famous for glades and cycling. And uh, Nottingham Forest is a local football team that one has to follow when you're born in Nottingham, which demonstrates that I'm, I'm an optimist as well, because they're not doing particularly well at the moment. Uh, I did my degrees at Leeds University. I'll talk a little bit on that and uh, then shifted to dark matter at Imperial and the UK Particle Physics Lab. And then in 2009, came out to Canada as director of uh, Snow Lab. So uh, my previous experience um, really is three phases. The first phase was looking at PV gamma ray astronomy, and that was based in Antarctica. Uh, then did dark matter searches at the Bulby Salt and Potash Mine in the UK. Uh, and that was uh, in a working salt mine, and then came to uh, Canada to work in Snow Lab, which is a working uh, nickel mine. So the labs that I've been in uh, are at three kilometer altitude, minus 71 is the coldest at the pole, minus one kilometer in uh, Bulby, which is at about 25 C, and then uh, in Snow Lab, the rock temperature is about 40 C. When you're on the surface, it gets down to minus 40. So I'm delighted to be working at a lab where you can open the window and not freeze or yeah, drown. So my uh, initial work was on astronomy at the South Pole, looking for PEV sources of gamma rays, and um, was part of a small team in 87, 88 that built the array. And you can see uh, this is the array at dusk. That's me working on one of the detectors during the winter. Uh, I spent about 12 and a half months there for the first time. This detector ran uh, almost a decade, 80, 88 through to 94. Unfortunately, it was too small to actually see gamma rays from PEV sources. We now know from uh, work from experiments on PES that uh, such sources really do exist. But the, so that's shown here, Veritas and HES sort of results in uh, PEV gamma ray. The, uh, so the results were inconclusive, but it was a great introduction to working in a facility, especially one where things like health and safety, working in the cold, uh, were really important. And then shift, shifted to dark matter. Um, this is the salt mine that we worked at um, in North Yorkshire, a Cleveland uh, boundary. And it was in a low activity rock salt environment. The initial lab infrastructure is shown here. So this was a genuine garden shed we got from the local DIY store. Uh, that's an early version of me working on one of the germanium detectors. And then around about 2001, we were able to upgrade uh, to, a, uh, to a facility that was hosting some of the dark matter experiments that the UK was running. Uh, and the work that I was engaged in was working on liquid xenon as a dark matter target, building three generations of what was called the Zeppelin detectors. And this was a really successful series of uh, projects from the technology perspective, in that they were the first to show that Xenon could be uh, used as a dark matter target, first to show the use of two-phase xen uh, Xenon for dark matter searches, and this is still the leading technology uh, of today. The sad thing is that uh, when I went back to Britain, you realize that the detector that you worked on is now in a museum. So this is uh, in the local Whitby Museum, showing the sort of experiments we were working on. And then uh, 2009 came over to Snow Lab, and this again was uh, deep underground science. So looking at dark matter, 
looking at uh, neutrinos, the evolution of the universe, um, and things like um, what the intrinsic physics and nature of neutrinos is. So this, uh, this is the original snow experiment that was built in the, the Vallo Crichton mine. And uh, this is a huge, uh, huge experiment. It originally ran with uh, heavy water and solved the solar neutrino problem. And Snow Lab grew out from that. So it's a joint venture of five Canadian universities funded through the CFI in the province and uh, with a lot of support from the host organization, Valley. Uh, just give you a couple of shots of what it looks like at Snow Lab. So the 6,800 is 6,800 feet down, so just over two kilometers. Uh, the typical entryway in a mine, so you have the, uh, the secondary support here to keep the, um, the rock, and then the rock bolts here are the primary support to uh, keep the pressure of the rock in, uh, in place. And then the sort of infrastructure we were building, uh, shown here, so this is two experiments deep, and Mini Clean was, was put into this tank, and this shows you the two detectors operating after a couple of years. So you get the sense of the scale. This is about um, something broad of 20, 20 meters across, 22 meters high. And uh, Snow Lab is now operating a suite of detectors. So the original snow experiment has been upgraded, replacing the heavy water with liquid scintillator. Uh, there's a suite of dark matter experiments. This is the deep project uh, that Triumph was engaged in. Uh, the news experiment and super CDMS is under construction, and that's a project that UBC and Triumph are also uh, engaged in. And finally, it shows you the it shows you the uh, underground lab at Snow Lab, and it's now pretty much populated. There is one cavity left, which is going to be um, the double beta decay experiment, and that hopefully will be Nexo, which is another project that Canada is engaged in with Triumph. Okay, so that's me. Um, so switching over to Triumph. Uh, Triumph is one of Canada's major investments in uh, large-scale research, so it's a major research facility. But it has, been, uh, it has been operating for over 50 years, so it's founded in 1968. The Triumph is the tri universities, and that's UBC, uh, SFU, and UVic. So the three local universities uh, building a meson facility. And uh, that was the original um, accelerator at Triumph, and the lab has grown from that uh, original cyclotron. Uh, so we have grown to a, um, be operated by a consortium of 20, soon to be 22 member universities across Canada, and that's from coast to coast. So you can see the universities here. And it's a, uh, we've developed into a multidisciplinary community uh, using these accelerators, uh, looking at multiple areas of research and uh, with a lot of impact in science, medicine, and uh, industry. And uh, this just shows the connections that we have with UBC, uh, between UBC and Triumph. So there's, there's very close linkages, obviously, with the, the Faculty of Science, but uh, also across other faculties at UBC including the School of Business. Uh, to give you a sense of the scale of operations at Triumph, we have um, about 550 staff now. Usually we would have uh, 1,000 scientists and researchers visiting each year, and uh, about 200 students, postdoc researchers on site. Of course, those numbers have been impacted over the last few years, over the last couple of years because of COVID. Uh, the, Triumph is, is, is central to a lot of the subatomic physics that happens in Canada, and about 80% of uh, projects, Canadian projects in subatomic physics, include Triumph in one way or another. We act as a gateway, um, which allows the Canadian community to engage internationally, and we have about 60 or over 60 international agreements and partnerships around the world. Uh, most obviously with places like CERN and KEK, other accelerator labs in the world. And in terms of business, uh, we're generating uh, quite a lot of economic activity. So over that six year period, uh, there's about $600 million of economic activity generated. So, um, so just to give a very brief introduction to you know, particle accelerators. 
So obviously a particle accelerator is simply it's a device that uses electromagnetic fields to accelerate and guide and this thing key part uh, charged particles. So you need a source, which is either electrons, protons, or ions. In, in our case, um, the source for the cyclotron is H minus. You need a vacuum so that you're able to, uh, the, these particles are able to go through the pipe without uh, being deflected or absorbed. Electric fields are used for acceleration and magnetic fields or electric fields are used for focusing and steering. And this is all backed by uh, very complex control systems. And those control systems are now becoming more complex and beginning to look at machine learning as ways that to tune up the system so that you can, uh, you know, this is a, uh, a technology that lends itself well to using machine learning to be able to really focus the beams. So just a, a 101 in terms of the acceleration of charged particles, clearly um, if you have a, a charged particle accelerating through an electric field, the force on it is the charge times the electric field or, or the mass times acceleration and uh, you rework that, the acceleration is Q over M times the electric field, so uh, charge over mass ratio is important there. The kinetic energy uh, is the charge times the voltage, and if you put that into um, natural units, if you like, uh, uh, in terms of EV, the kinetic energy uh, becomes the charge times the voltage measured in EV. And that's the traditional measure that you would use in accelerator science. So one EV, simply the, uh, the energy a single charged particle gets accelerating through a potential of one volt. And in heavy iron accelerators, we often uh, use that in terms of Q over A uh, times the voltage, so EV per mass unit. Now, that's to accelerate the particle, you would use an electric field. To um, steer the particles, you use a magnetic field. And that's possible because the acceleration is perpendicular to the direction that the particle is moving. So the magnetic force is the charge and then the velocity across the magnetic field. And it's per so it's perpendicular to the uh, direction of travel. And that means that if you have a magnetic field going into the screen, for instance, you'll actually end up with a bending uh, moment on the particles. And the radius uh, is given by this equation here. So you, you, can, you see that you can use magnetic fields for beam manipulation. And that's bending and focusing uh, to ensure that you have very tight beams. There are a couple of ways to um, develop accelerators using electric fields. One is circular accelerators, so you see this in places like CERN, and one is linear, linear accelerators, and we actually have both types at, uh, at Triumph. So in a circular accelerator, you'll have multiple passes through a small number of cavities, so you, know, you accelerate them and then allow them to travel around the beam. So they're not actually circular. That's a key part, of course. You know, the, the acceleration is through legs, which are an invader accelerating. So, uh, so yeah, they have uh, flat sides at which the acceleration occurs. In a linear accelerator, you would have a single pass through a large number of cavities, so that this would um, basically give you the kick in a, in a linear direction without the losses. The technology um, that Triumph has become expert in is uh, the use of radio frequency accelerators. And this is a, uh, a concept that goes back many years, goes back um, to 1928 with Widerow. And the idea here is that you can use the same alternate, alternating voltage uh, at RF, and you can then accelerate the particle through uh, basically acceleration segments that have gaps between them. And as the voltage changes with the RF, the particle is hopping between each of these uh, acceleration uh, sequences. So here, you know, frequency of about a megahertz in a field of uh, 25 kilovolts in the original uh, test. And that's uh, what the RF linup would look like and uh, giving you a little animation of the process. So obviously as the particle uh, accelerates, these segments become longer because you've got to keep the, because uh, basically they're traveling faster as the RF flips. So um, Triumph uh, utilizes 
the cyclotron as its core piece of um, machinery. And the cyclotron was invented um, in 32 by Ernst Lawrence. And the technique here is to uh, inject an iron at the center of two discs, and you have a magnetic field which will cause the, the iron to move in a spiral. And then as the, um, as the particle steps between these two Ds, you have the uh, radio frequency amplification happening across this gap. So that the, the, as the particle uh, rotates, it gets a kick, rotates, gets a kick, and so on. And this allows you to build up the, um, the velocity, the energy of the, of the particle uh, as it rotates around throughout the cyclotron. And then at some point, of course, it gets spat out and kicked out into uh, a usable um, speed. So the cyclotron that we have at Triumph is uh, the world's largest cyclotron. Uh, there is, you know, we do have um, a certificate from Guinness World Records on the wall. And it uses H- as the proton driver. Um, and it, um, because it's the large cyclotron, you can get it up to 520 MeV. And that creates proton about 500 MeV up to 100 microamps. So this is the world's largest cyclotron. It's a uh, schematic shown here. This, this is a photograph during the construction, of course. And you can see the, uh, the segments of the cyclotron. So they're, they're basically the gaps through which the acceleration will occur. You then have uh, these beam lines coming off from the cyclotron, which are then uh, sent to down beam lines for useful science. And a shot inside the cyclotron here. Um, so over the last five decades, this cyclotron has been the core of the, uh, the operations at Triumph and re remains so to this day. Okay, so uh, this is the Triumph Accelerator complex overall. And the cyclotron itself is down here. But you'll see that uh, it, Triumph has grown substantially in terms of the number of accelerators that were, were operating. And the primary driver is this 520 MeV um, cyclotron. Uh, it can produce rare isotopes, it can produce neutrons and muons. And that's what's shown here, uh, some of these beam lines that come down, for instance, to uh, an area where we do material science studies, uh, generate medical isotopes. There are um, isotope separators and, and acceleration for those isotope separate, uh, for the isotopes that are separated. And that's Isaac 1 and Isaac 2. Uh, so this uses a technique uh, called ISOL. So it's separating it basically uh, in line. And Isaac 1 uses a uh, normal conducting <coughs> LINAC. And that generates uh, around about well, one to two, up to two MeV per mass unit uh, in terms of the isotopes that can be created. The beam is also capable of being fed to Isaac 2, which uses a superconducting LINAC, and that allows us to get up another order of magnitude for something like uh, 16 MeV per mass unit. And uh, those radioactive beams are then obviously fed to targets and detectors. The um, accelerator complex that we're currently working on is called Aerial, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Uh, and this is a superconducting electron LINAC, uh, which will be at about 30 MeV and reasonably high current at 10 milliamps. And that is in, process, in, in progress at the moment uh, under construction. And then finally, there are four, currently four cyclotrons which are being used for medical isotope production. So that's generating uh, fluorine, generating carbon-11, uh, which is used in... Uh, medical imaging. So there's actually a, an underground line from Triumph, the UDC, called the rabbit line, where uh, isotopes are created at Triumph, put into a little package and fired up Westbrook Mall to Triumph, where they then, uh, to UDC, to the hospital, where they're then used directly in patients. Uh, I think that one, one of the uh, things that really surprised me when I came here was I hadn't really appreciated how many accelerators Triumph utilizes. I knew about the, uh, obviously, the cyclotron and ISAC, but the fact that we have these additional low energy um, cyclotrons dotted around the uh, complex was also uh, yeah, impressive. 
So Ariel uh, is this uh, advanced rare isotope lab, and this is one that uses a superconducting LINAC. And the uh, intent here, one, one of the drawbacks of the way that the triumph operation is structured is that you can only steer beam off the uh, cyclotron to one target at a time at the moment. So the science is limited. And Ariel is going to move us into a different phase where uh, we're going to end up with three targets uh, or the ability to um, put beam onto three, three targets, which will obviously increase the science that we'll be able to support concurrently. And what's shown here is the path by which we can do that. So we have the existing ISAC lines. We will have a proton beam, which will um, be accelerated through aerial uh, and can be put into the ISAC facility. And then there's this superconducting E-LINAC, which will provide uh, the electrons, which will uh, also be fed basically into the ISAC targets. So we, we end up with uh, a 30 MeV, a new 30 MeV superconducting the a new 100 kilowatt uh, electron beam line and target station uh, onto which we dump the uh, electron beam, and a 50 kilowatt proton beam line and target station. And a, uh, a recent uh, milestone, so this is under construction now, and a recent milestone uh, just in September of this year the ELINAC achieved a 10 kilowatt beam power at 30 MeV. So that was, that was the target that they were trying to get to during this phase. They actually reached it three months ahead of schedule. Uh, and that's building up to the, the final uh, beam uh, power that we're looking at at 30. So Ariel, uh, we've had significant advances in the target station and radioactive beam modules as well. Uh, on the Top right is a photograph of the target um, target pit. So this is where both the proton and the electron beam lines will come in. There are two target stations in this in uh, this area here, presumably those arrows, and um, those the, the spallation products will then be fed out. The radioactive beams will, uh, will then be fed out to the Isaac uh, beam lines. Uh, so this is all concrete, and this is. Um, you know, it's amazing to watch. So a lot of the infrastructure just gets buried in concrete as you're building these shielding uh, areas. The aerial hot cell, so this is used for the um, target work, is the most complex and expensive bit of aerial. And that's recently passed the factory acceptance test in, uh, in France. And so we're expecting that to appear uh, on site sometime in January next year. So that will be a major step for us when, uh, when we can start installing the hot cell itself. And then we have uh, the target and iron source. Um, there's a, a, an acceptance stand, which is used to uh, basically make sure these systems work. And uh, those tests have started, the, the, the test stand and modules have been completed. Okay, so that's the infrastructure that we, we have on site. Uh, as I mentioned, we also uh, act as a gateway, supporting the Canadian community into international um, accelerator complexes uh, like CERN and KEK. But to uh, come back to Triumph locally and just talk about some of the research that we've been doing. So the, uh, the core of Triumph is the accelerators and uh, the ability to develop these um, uh, high, high efficiency, uh, low or high efficiency detectors. And that then in, uh, allows us to uh, deliver several through threads of science. So that would include particle physics, nuclear physics, we're doing uh, material science, but we're also engaged in cosmology, dark matter science, uh, looking at astro, uh, astro particle, nuclear astrophysics, and uh, then the detector testing, materials testing, and uh, medical uh, isotopes that I'll talk about as well. So nuclear physics at Triumph uh, covers a wide range. So the, uh, it's one of the core areas that, um, that Triumph supports. And there's a huge suite of different detector systems, uh, both on, uh, in the Isaac target station and in the, uh, the main meson hall. And the sort of the, the areas of nuclear physics that we're looking at focus on these three pillars. Uh, so the precision tests of fundamental interactions. And uh, this is um, 
facilitated by using atom traps, you know, laser manipulation, looking at the decay modes of, uh, of, of these radioactive ions that we, we generate. There is nuclear structure dynamics, uh, which is looking at you know, basically the inner workings of the nucleus, looking at the shell structure, understanding the shape, understanding the, uh, the energy levels and so on, and the excited state properties of, uh, of the radioactive ions that we create. And uh, again, a large suite of detectors uh, developed to allow us to fulfill that, uh, that science goal. And then finally, uh, nuclear astrophysics, um, and this is where you're looking at important reactions for nuclear astrophysics, so stellar burning, supernova explosions. How do those, uh, how, how do these radioactive ions uh, basically interact and um, their decay systems? So that's looking at uh, stellar evolution and nuclear synthesis. So some uh, recent results from the, um, from the nuclear physics program. Uh, the one on the, the left is uh, looking at the, basically the shape uh, of um, helium-8. And this is a doubly magic uh, nucleus, but it shows a large deformation, uh, which was unexpected. So there's information there about the nuclear structure, about the way that the nucleus is, uh, is, is behaving. On the right, uh, there's a measurement of a uh, um, P-alpha reaction on copper, and uh, this is part of the nuclear astrophysics uh, program. And this is looking, uh, th this is an important process for X-ray bursts, uh, looking at the processes in stars. And so th these are um, nuclear physics projects that we, uh, we can support by the generation of these sort of radioactive isotopes, yeah, and then putting them into uh, these uh, high efficiency detector systems and looking at the interactions. A, uh, another use of, uh, uh, of these radioactive ion beams is um, you can implant these ions into, into sensors. And so this is, um, this is a search that's been undertaken looking actually for sterile neutrinos. And uh, the process here is that the beryllium-7 that we can create has been implanted into uh, quantum sensors. It's been implanted into superconducting tunnel junction diodes. Those diodes are then taken to Lawrence Livermore, uh, where they're operated. And the, the science that is being looked at is electron capture on, on, on the beryllium. And that electron capture would basically create a nuclear recoil and a neutrino. And uh, that process, uh, so the, the, this, uh, the rate at which this process happens or doesn't, in this case, uh, allows you to set some limitations on KUV to MEV scale sterile neutrinos. So this is a, uh, a, a, a connection using both the quantum sensing expertise, but also the, uh, the beryllium-7 that can be generated in the radioactive IMB sources. So uh, you know, a great coupling of two areas of work that we uh, were engaged in. On particle physics, uh, there, there's a strong connection to um, support the particle physics community in Canada, the same uh, sites other than uh, Triumph. And examples here, for instance, are you know, Atlas is one of the uh, large groups in particle physics at Triumph, obviously working at CERN and uh, the analysis that they've been engaged in, for instance, looking at Di-Higgs cross-sections. Uh, Hyper-K is a, uh, oh, and there's, uh, we'll move off Atlas. That's called the new small wheel. It's giant, of course, because it's Atlas. And uh, Triumph was engaged strongly, as Canada was, in the construction of the new small, small wheels for Atlas, and they are now being installed. Hyper-K is a neutrino um, detector in Japan. So this is looking at, at uh, a beam of neutrinos fired across Japan into a water Cherenkov detector. And uh, we are involved in developing some of the uh, test experimentation for Hyper-K uh, at, at the moment. Alpha is uh, another uh, project that uh, Triumph and UBC are engaged in. And this, uh, this is also at CERN, 
and it's looking at uh, anti uh, antimatter basically, so uh, trapping antiprotons, creating uh, anti hydrogen, and uh, looking at the uh, looking at the characteristics of this uh, of this material. Ultimately, uh, one of the long term goals is to see whether antimatter behaves the same as matter in gravitational fields. Then closer to home, Super CDMS is a dark matter experiment I've already mentioned uh, that is under construction at Snow Run. Triathlon's also engaged, as many in Canada were, in T2K. Um, and it's just a uh, 2018 cover article from Nature showing the, uh, uh, the original results from T2K with, uh, where there's a preference for CP violation, which would uh, inform the matter antimatter asymmetry. That's the, uh, if you like, the um, outside Triumph particle physics program. Within Triumph, we're developing a, a, an ultra cold neutron uh, experiment. And uh, this is looking at the electron, electric dipole moment on the neutron to see whether there is um, deviation from the standard model in terms of the electric dipole moment you would expect to see uh, on, on a neutron. Uh, and uh, there are two aspects to this. One is the, the UCN source itself. So this is uh, an ultra cold neutron source. So uh, here we're using spallation from, uh, from cyclotron to create neutrons. Those neutrons then get moderated through heavy water and deuterium, slowed down and captured in superfluid helium-4. And uh, those ultra cold neutrons, I mean, you know, basically you can put them in a bottle but those ultra cold neutrons are there extracted through to uh, the neutron electric dipole moment um, and any other user <coughs> that's required. So this, this uh, project is now underway and construction has started on both components. Uh, a major upcoming project, uh, this again is back in Snow Lab, is the neutrino loss double beta decay program and uh, I mentioned in Snow Lab there's one cavity that's left to be, uh, to be filled and uh, it's targeted for this double beta decay program. So this will be a ton scale neutrinoless double beta decay experiment. And the, uh, there is an international com uh, collaboration developing between Europe and North America to try to make sure that we can develop two ton scale experiments. And uh, that basically references one using germanium and one using Xenon. So Xenon 136 and germanium 76 both exhibit double beta decay, neutrino double beta decay because of the energy levels. Uh, and this is a, a, an ongoing discussion, as you can see, the, uh, there was recently a summit in September of this year. Uh, at which the, uh, this stakeholder group agreed in principle. So this involved INFN, the uh, Italian funding agency, it involved DOE, the US funding agency, and it involved ISAID, uh, who pay both NSERC and CFI from Canada. So this was a, uh, um, a high-powered international stakeholder group. And uh, they put out a statement that in principle, uh, we need two ton scale systems. Uh, and this, I think, is a requirement in this field because this is discovery science. So in the same way that you have Atlas and CMS at CERN, the intent would be to have uh, two detectors, similar sensitivity to double beta decay. And then you'll be able to pick up, you know, make sure that you're not uh, being fooled by one of the signals. And the front runner uh, for the project to go to Snow Lab is a project called Nexo using liquid xenon. And that will be the next big experiment in Canada. Uh, this would be about a $400 million project coming into Canada. Um, and we have some funding lined up from uh, CFI uh, through Triumph, and there are major developments expected in, uh, in Canada on this. Connected to double beta decay, and this is linking back to Triumph, um, the Triumph nuclear theorists uh, using ab initio calculations, uh, basically ab initio nuclear theory, so going from the beginning all the way through. Uh, and they're looking at the, uh, some of the uh, what are called nuclear matrix elements in double beta decay. So this is the way that the, the nucleus impacts on the, um, on the rate at which they would uh, exhibit neutrinoless double beta decay. 
And this has been a long running issue in double beta science that over the last 25 years, several approaches have been used to calculate these matrix elements. And they have been uh, discrepant by up to an order of magnitude or more, depending on the, um, depending on the nucleus that you're looking at. And uh, the ab initio root uh, provides you know, a really solid way to do this calculation. And so the, uh, there have been a couple of very high profile publications in PRL and Physics Review, uh, which uh, are providing information uh, to this community. And that was something that involved students from UBC. Uh, so the final area I want to talk about in terms of our research was life sciences, which is a relatively new area, uh, say relatively new and it's been running for uh, 15 years or more. But uh, it has several areas. So this um, looks at using the, the, uh, the ion beams that we create. It looks at uh, the ability to do nuclear chemistry on site and the ability to uh, basically put that uh, radioactive ion onto uh, or implant that isotope onto a protein, which can then be used to target either uh, or either to target or to um, be used to uh, visualize cancers. And this is an area that uh, Triumph is uh, beginning to develop uh, substantial expertise and capabilities in. Uh, this plot, I put it in because it, it, it surprised me when I saw it, but there's, there's a wide range of uh, potential medical isotopes that can be used in this way. And you can use them for imaging, so that's a PET, sket, PET spec type of scanning, or you can use them for therapy. And uh, the area that we're, I'll talk about in a minute that we're really moving into is alpha therapy uh, for reasons that I'll talk about. Now, this, this is an area where, uh, not so much with physics, but you know, we have a very strong partnership with, with UBC. And um, there's a project that we're developing in partnership with UBC called IARMY that will allow us to start creating substantial quantities of these uh, GMP, good manufacturing practice, compliant tracers. And these are used for uh, brain studies at UBC. The emerging opportunity at Triumph uh, that we're developing is using targeted alpha, uh, alpha therapy. And the, the issue with alphas, of course, is that they're uh, very destructive, but they, they only travel a short distance. So if you can get them into the cancer, they're highly destructive, and they're not going to uh, destruct. They're highly destructive locally. They'll get rid of the cancer, but they won't um, uh, impact uh, the living tissue around the cancer. And that's obviously different to things like um, gamma uh, therapy, where you know, the gamma is uh, having to travel right through your body. Uh, an example that we, uh, well, the world is looking at uh, very seriously now is actinium 225. And this is connected to uh, this PMSA, PSMA uh, molecule, which is then uh, tagging onto the cancer. And uh, shown here are some studies that were done in Germany where um, this is somebody who had prostate cancer. And you can see the, the black marks are cancer. So this is a, a, a PET scan, a PET scan. Uh, the black areas are the cancer. Uh, and this will be an individual that would have exhausted all of the possible routes. So you know, this, this individual is going to die soon. The application of actinium-225 um, through three doses and then another dose has basically removed all cancer. And that's because of the application of the alpha into the cancer being so localized that it's, it's taking out the cancer and it's, it's riddled through you know, this individual's body. But because of the, the targeting nature, you know, it will seek out and destroy those cancers. So this is, uh, you know, this is a an incredible uh, opportunity uh, to, to really contribute to uh, medical isotopes because the capabilities that we have at Triumph are well matched to production of actinium-225. And uh, what's shown here is the uh, main proton beam line that we have, and there'll be a, uh, a, there's a target 
there's a hoist which brings it up the IPF as the radiation facility. And you can then take that target and um, extract the actinium-225. So it's, uh, it's irradiation of thorium. Um, the, and part of this process, of course, is the ensuring that it's medical grade. And so there's a lot of quality uh, assurance that goes on. And our current focus is being able to generate you know, 400 megavectoral of product. And uh, by the end of well, the focus this year, was aiming for uh, 3.7 gigabacter. This leads to um, the Institute for Advanced Medical Isotopes, which is a new development at Triumph. And this is a 50 million facility which has support from UBC, as well as the province, BC Cancer, and uh, the federal government. And the intent is to develop um, uh, basically a center that will act as a, uh, a global center for nuclear medicine research and production. And it will be uh, central to the uh, ability for BC to manage its pipeline of medical isotopes. So full funding for this was uh, announced uh, three years ago, just back, yep, three years ago uh, by the prime minister and work is currently underway on site. So this is the current status of the building we expect it to be finished by next summer and uh, basically operational handover uh, at, uh, next fall. And finally, um, in terms of the medical connection, one of the um, aspects of running a lab like Triumph that um, is, you know, is really exciting is the ability to draw together people with so many different skills to attack a problem. And um, an example of this was a, uh, a mechanical ventilator that the, the, several of, of the national labs in Canada uh, basically got together and we were able to design and build a new type of ventilator in about three months. This was at the start of COVID when it wasn't sure you know, when the vaccine would be produced. And so uh, there's a lot of talk you may remember about needing to make sure you had ventilators available in hospitals. So this was conceived as a, a low-cost, reliable, um, basically fail-safe approach to ventilation. And it grew out of, you remember I was talking about the DEEP experiment, which is a liquid argon experiment. It grew out from uh, work that Art McDonald, uh, others, uh, Christiana Gabrielfi, uh, who's the leader of a similar project called Dark Side in Italy, they realized that the techniques that we use for liquid argon in particle particle astrophysics is directly applicable to, to the um, problems that uh, you need to address in terms of building a ventilator. And so uh, from March the 19th, I remember Art phoning me up, I was at Snow Lab at the time, and I remember Art phoning me up saying, yeah, what do you think? And it's like, yeah, we're in. Of course we're in. That's what we're going to do. So we were able to pull together a, uh, a really impressive team very rapidly. And by September, we got full Health Canada approval um, for this ventilator, which was quite astonishing. And there's about 7,000 units that have been produced and uh, delivered to the government. So that's the, uh, that's the sort of science. I mean, it's a very thin scan across the science that we do at um, Triumph, but it gives you a, a sense of the uh, sort of things that we can facilitate using the infrastructure we have. Um, I just wanted to finish off talking about uh, some of the future directions that we're going. And uh, an important step for us is that earlier this year, on June the 1st, we incorporated as a not-for-profit charity, not-for-profit entity with charitable status. And uh, so Try and Think is a, a, uh, an entirely new organization. And this has been coming uh, in, in development for several years. But the intent is to allow us to take a, a more streamlined governance approach. And uh, this is to facilitate that sort of thing you can do with, um, with the ventilator, where you have a, a huge amount of expertise, you have a huge amount of capabilities in the lab, and to be able to pivot it, you need an agile governance structure. And basically this is what uh, has been introduced on June the 1st. So we are still, um, you know, it's going to take as many more months to shake down exactly how all this works together. And what you can't read on the side very well are the various bodies that uh, we have in the government structure, which includes GBC. So Colin, for instance, is uh, on the Members Council uh, of, of Triumph. 
uh, and uh, you know, it's the representative of UBC on our government structure. So this is a big step for us. The other big step that we're going through at the moment is developing a 20 year vision. And um, this has been in progress for quite some time, but the, the intent um, is to allow us to be able to, to um, basically describe where we want to be in 20 years. And uh, part of the issue that we have um, at Triumph in terms of the funding is that we, we receive funding in five years, five year tranches, but we are a uh, formally a sunsetted project. <clears throat> so every five years we have to demonstrate why Triumph is worth keeping, basically. And that makes it really hard when you're trying to develop these long-term programs. So the uh, approach that's being taken is to develop a 20 year vision and this will be able uh, to you know, describe to uh, funding agencies and government uh, why we think we have a role to play in 20 years. So the process that we've, uh, we've been through on the 20 year vision uh, earlier this year, or well, started last, uh, last fall, is basically a visioning and listening phase where uh, we've had multiple uh, stakeholders engage, uh, many focus groups, if you like, bringing together ideas about where Triumph could go, what we might get engaged in over the next uh, 20 years. We've just finished a um, phase two, which is convergence on the vision framework. And so this is taking all of that input, and we've got a lot of it, and uh, bringing that down to some high level pillars. Uh, high level areas that we think we should be looking at. The intent is that this isn't a very long document. You know, this is meant to be 15 pages, so it's meant to be crisp. And so it will, by default, be a high level um, document because it's a vision, not a plan. And the phase that we're in at the moment is the finalization, where uh, by the end of this winter, uh, probably January, uh, we will have the first draft uh, available for the board. And the, uh, you know, the overarching direction that we have is uh, we still see ourselves basically as an, uh, uh, a fundamental research facility utilizing accelerators. But as I hope I've described to you, those accelerators can be used in a multiple, uh, multiple ways, including developing convergence research. And the idea is that you know, Triumph remains um, an organization that can leave a leverage its multidisciplinary nature to uh, really uh, support the Canadian research ecosystem. And you'll notice that you know, there's an obvious change to the diagram there that um, green tech, the where Triumph can fit in with some of these, uh, well, the defining challenge that, uh, that society is facing at the moment in terms of climate change. How does try and contribute to that is something that we are uh, actively working on at the moment and uh, hope that well, we intend that that will be a major part of what we're doing in 20 years. Now uh, we have three high level positioning statements. Uh, so so the, the intent is that we will remain a particle accelerator center, radioisotope, radioisotope hub for science and medicine and industry. Uh, we intend in 20 years that we you know, are recognized as a strategic Canadian asset. We do have unique infrastructure. We have unique expertise. We have unique capabilities. And they augment the capabilities in universities. They augment the capabilities in industry. And they augment the capabilities in research labs that the government runs. And so we see Triumph as being able to tie a lot of this stuff together so that we can react quickly um, to mission requirements as they come up. And then uh, basically saying a similar sort of thing that Triumph sits at a center of a coordinated big science in enterprise. Uh, the way that Canada at the moment manages major research facilities needs evolution to be uh, to really get the best out of those major uh, major labs. And uh, just to finish, if you know, if you thought developing a vision is something that's new. Uh, when I was looking at previous plans in Canada, uh, I found uh, this was from the 1964 Canadian Association of Physics Annual Congress. And uh, the first invited papers are, you know, what is the role of fundamental physics in Canada and where are we going? 
So visioning has been something that's been going on since 1964, which is when I was born. So I know it's 57 years ago. So thank you.